Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Lauren Dykovich. She is the author of the book, Life, Love, and Alzheimer's. She also has a very active Instagram page where she's very supportive of those of us still going through the caregiving journey. So thanks for joining me, Lauren. Hi, thank you for having me. You're welcome. So you and I are a bit in the same boat. My mom passed away March 31st, 2020, and your mom passed away April 4th, 2020. So we're both a little bit past a year, but you were a really young caregiver. So do you want to start by telling us your story? And one of the common themes that Lauren and I had as I was reading her book, I realized that we both had lots of guilt. So we're also going to touch a bit on guilt, why we feel it, and maybe how to not feel it. So that's our plan for this afternoon. <laughs> so why don't you start with your story, but don't give it all away because people should really read the book. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I was 25 years old when my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. She was 62 at the time. I was working full time, uh, my first full time job, you know, adult job as a police officer. And I actually got engaged the same month that my mom was diagnosed. So the first thing I did after her diagnosis was to plan my wedding without my mom. And then things got harder over the years. I ended up um, quitting my full-time job to become a part-time caregiver for my mom. And I sort of did that off and on over the next few years, had a couple of moves in there. So I did like the long distance caregiving um, and then moved back home just a few months before my mom passed away last year on April 4th of 2020. So a few years into her diagnosis, I started sharing my story on a blog. Um, I just kind of felt like I wanted to get my story out there for other young women who didn't maybe didn't know somebody their own age that was going through a parent having Alzheimer's. Uh, and through that, I wrote a book and started my um, social media accounts and everything uh, called Life, Love and Alzheimer's. And just have been continuing to share my story and anything that I've learned um, throughout the 10 years that my mom was uh, living with Alzheimer's. So when we were, before we started recording, we were talking about support groups as a way of maybe help alleviating guilt. And you didn't go to any support groups because, because you were so young. You want to tell us a little bit about why you made that choice? Yeah. Uh, being 25 when my mom was diagnosed, like I didn't know anybody else my age that had a parent who had Alzheimer's. And I think it was the day after my mom got her diagnosis, I called my best friend and I told her that my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she said, oh yeah, I know about that. You know, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, but I thought that was a lot different than having a parent that had Alzheimer's when you were I mean, just a grandparent and a parent, depending on the relationship, like it can be a lot different. And being 25 and having a parent with it is different than having a grandparent with it. So right away, I kind of felt like no one's going to understand what I'm going through. None of my peers, nobody my age is going to relate to this. They're not going to relate to me. They're not going to understand what this is like and what I'm going through. So I really shut down right, right from the beginning. And I didn't talk about my mom's diagnosis to really anyone. My uh, fiance at the time obviously knew, my family knew, uh, some mutual friends knew because my I have an older sister. She told some of our mutual friends. I didn't tell anybody except that one friend on the phone that day. And when she said that about her grandmother, that was it. I just thought no one's ever going to relate to what I'm going through. and. I would look up information, you know, online, which social media, what this was back in um, 2010, which was when she was diagnosed. So social media wasn't, you know, what it is today. There weren't people 
sharing blogs and things on, I don't even think Instagram was around yet. Um, Mm -hmm. And there weren't people on Facebook sharing their story. There weren't support groups on Facebook yet. It wasn't, not everybody had Facebook. I think you still had to have like your email address in order to get a Facebook or something. Um, And so there wasn't, there was no information out there. I couldn't find anything. And the only thing that I did find was the Alzheimer's Association website. And it really wasn't any like personal stories on there. It really wasn't at the time, at least the information didn't cater to like a younger person dealing with the disease. And although they had support groups listed on there, I just felt like I'm going to be the youngest person at the support group. It was like at some church on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock or something. I thought there's not going to be anybody my age there. And I don't want to go have to drive somewhere at a, on a specific day at a specific time to, I worked shift work also at when my mom was first diagnosed. So there were a lot of these meetings that I couldn't go to anyway. I was working at night or different things like that, which also played a huge uh, factor in it, just not being conducive to my schedule to be able to actually go somewhere for a meeting. And I just really felt like nobody's going to get it. No one's going to understand. No one's going to be able to relate to what I'm going through being 25 years old. And so I never sought support groups. uh, And I really did not talk about it for the first like three or four years, probably. Just crazy. I laugh because my support group right now, it's still online. But my support group is a Thursday night at a church in the evening. <laughs> and I am the youngest one. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But, <laughs> you know, we're in like the kid room with there's lots of brightly colored, very specific artwork on the wall. And it's like, you know, I've been in groups like networking <laughs> groups and we meet at we meet at places that are kind and generous and allow us to you know, be there cheap or free. So, you know, no criticisms there. It's just kind of, I don't know. I I would be, it would be really nice if we could have like a nice, like cozy room with couches and I don't know, it'd be, it'd be, it's, it's been so long since we've met in person. I don't think I'd care at this point, but (laughs) I usually am the youngest person. And as I've told Lauren, and I think I've said this on the podcast before, I would go and they they always ask you to introduce yourself and tell the group who you're taking care of and I would I would laugh because unless a spouse came with you know the adult child which I really hate that term so if if mom was taking care of dad and the daughter came along as a support to mom then there was usually somebody my age or a little bit younger but I was always the youngest person who'd have whose loved one had had the disease the longest. So I always felt like I got like the double gold star and (laughs) our group was really good. The very first night I went, I felt very supported and like, okay, this is the right place to be. The second month I had enough information that I could help somebody. So I was like, this is really good, but there's, there are times there's, you know, I've run across people who don't, They just want to, I don't know, I don't, I'm trying not to be super nasty negative, but they don't, I think they're in such a difficult position. They don't, they don't want to, they want to, they just want somebody to listen, which is fine, but they don't like literally take the action that people are suggesting. Maybe they've tried, maybe they're burned out. Maybe they just like, I don't know. There's just been people that have come in and out of our group that, you know, they, they come and lots of us have been dealing with this a long time. A lot of, a lot of the group there, like some of us, there's two of us in our group currently, whose one gal's husband died last year. My mom died last year. Other people, their persons in late, the late stages of the disease. So a lot of us have been dealing with this a long time and we give advice and some people give like very specific advice. Oh, I dealt with the same thing at the same place. You need to talk to these people. Like go and do X. It's not, it's not ambiguous at all. It's not like it's, it's very clear. And then they don't do it and they come back the next month and they whine. And it's like, if you're not gonna, why are you here? Like, how are we supporting you if, 
yeah. so frustrating. But I felt really good about yeah. going and, you know, getting, feeling better about my choices and being able to help other people. That was a really good um, combination, I guess is the right word. So both of us have looked at the Facebook caregiver pages and we're not super fond of those. My, my issue with those <laughs> is there's a lot of non, I don't, when I say non-helpful, I'm talking about emojis or, oh, I've been there. I get it. You know, maybe that helps some people, you know, it might help you in the moment, but then you're like, okay, great. But how did you handle it? It's kind of the thing. So right, it's a very interesting position to be in. So one of the things that was really common between the two of us that I got out of your book was constantly feeling guilty. And we were talking a little bit about this online. Neither one of us really knows why everybody feels so guilty, but we're going to kind of touch on it a little bit. But you may have heard uh, some dog ear flapping. Lauren's got two black labs, right? (laughs) Yeah, I have two black labs, uh, Oakley and Lucy. And Lucy is here with me. She's always by my side. And she brought me uh, her little duck toy. So she was very excited to show it to me. And now I think hopefully she'll take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I had until uh, November of 2020, I had similar. I have two golden retrievers. We had three. Our oldest guy um, passed away right before Thanksgiving, right after his 13th birthday. So, you know, 2020 was just lovely, but yeah, he was the same way. My husband referred to him as my stalker and he had very bad arthritis in his back legs and he would follow me everywhere anyway. It's like, it might've been difficult. Oh, it was just, you know, and then, you know, when it's time to take him to the vet, cause there's not, there's no quality of life left and we have to like, let them go. You know, I got up from the floor to get a tissue and he struggled to get up to follow me. And I'm like, please Aww. don't do that. This makes this whole process 10 times worse. <laughs> so Aww, I can totally yeah. relate. That's why I'm like, I thought I heard a squeaky toy in there too. So if you hear some funny noises, it's <laughs> Lucy. <laughs> I tried to play it off, but she's loud. So <laughs> Well, I don't have any dogs in here with me today. It's kind of a little odd. Usually the girl dog is sprawled on the couch on her back, just looking all zen-like. And then the the youngest one, he sleeps on the floor. He's starting to be a little bit Aww. of a shadow. I think I think now that yeah. the other one's personality is not so dominant, the other two are like, oh yeah, we right. can hang out with mom more again. So that's a that's our little dog diversion for the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> We were, let's, let's go back a little bit. So I know when you were planning your wedding, it was really emotionally challenging because there was things you wanted to share with your mom that you couldn't because, you know, she just wasn't in that space anymore. Do you think that's like, I think one of the reasons that Alzheimer's caregivers have guilt is, and this is like really kind of stretch it, but I think almost like we feel guilty for like trying to continue on with our own lives. Like yeah, somehow, yeah, somehow it's like a subtle, subtle, like, well, I know you're sick and, and there's nothing we can do other than, you know, try to give you a nice quality of life while we can. I don't know why we feel guilty that we should live our own lives, especially at 25. And I think I was like 32 when my mom started showing signs. So my daughter was five. If I could do the math right. (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, it's just, it's hard. And I don't know if I ever told you, but my, when my dad was on hospice, his best friend, we were discussing various things and his friend turns and looks at me and he goes, well, now your dad assumes your mom will come live with you. Oh, that's nice. Now, regular listeners would know Mm -hmm. my reaction to that was like, uh, no, I mean, I was literally 50 years old. (laughs) My dad died March 2nd, 2017. My daughter moved out February 1st, 2017. She was 25. So you can relate. It's like, uh, no, I've been working since I was 16. I deserve to have like, you know, it's like, I've gone through the raising of the kid. I'm not jumping into like, full-time caring of my mom, but I still felt guilty with that choice. 
And especially since yeah, she only lived three years after he died. So there are days I think, well, you know, had I known, would I have not put her in memory care? And the choice for memory care was made because my sister still works full time. She has school age kids. My husband and I are self-employed. So I'm like, I don't know how we're going to manage that. If she's here, we'd have to have a caregiver during the day. And, and then yeah. what would they do? You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like there was a lot of rip roar and activity excitement going. There's like no stimulation. And she had friends right, yeah. in memory care. She did activities that she like went on the bus. They did bus rides every week. I don't know where they went because yeah, we're in the suburbs. <laughs> Not like there's like exciting places to go. And I think all <laughs> right. of that was a really beneficial to her. So I, I know I made the right choice, but sometimes I still think, well, you know, if I had I known, would I have made a different decision? So yeah, what is your? I mean, see. I think it's so easy. Uh, I think it's so easy to second guess yourself and to always wonder if you're doing the right thing. And, you know, it's so hard because they are losing pieces of themselves every day. And it's so hard to watch that and to witness that and just to know that there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can try to make them comfortable and happy. And I always say that you can't change the outcome of the disease, but you can change the journey. And I think that is why there's so much guilt is that you just know that no matter what you do, no matter how much you do, it'll never be enough because it's never going to fix them or cure them or make them better. But you feel like for whatever reason, if I had just done that one more thing, if I had just talked to her for five more minutes, if I had just stayed to visit for five more minutes, if I had just bent over backwards you know, one more time. And it, the thing is that it doesn't make a difference. It really doesn't make a difference. But when we're in it, it's so easy to convince yourself that you're a bad daughter or a bad son or a bad husband or wife, because you didn't do like the, you know, you did a hundred things for them today, but you didn't do that 101 thing, you know? And I just think it's so easy to beat yourself up over it and just to kind of dwell on what you didn't do or what you think you could have done better, or maybe what you did wrong or that you snapped at them or, and I think that's what a lot of the guilt, you know, comes from that. And I also think, you know, it's different in all ages. Uh, for me personally, being 25, I was trying to like start my own life. I was trying to separate myself from the nuclear family of mom, dad, and my sister who was already moved out and married. Um, and I was still, um, no, well, shortly before my mom was diagnosed, I was still living at home, working my first full-time job, and then kind of just easily just transitioned into living with my boyfriend. And then we happened to get engaged uh, the same month that my mom was diagnosed. So it was the guilt of like leaving home and, you know, leaving my mom and dad and feeling like I'm abandoning them because I moved out now. I don't live with them anymore. And oh God, now I'm going to get married. And how dare I, you know, do anything like fun or, and just, it's just everything. I mean, planning my wedding without her and feeling like I was leaving her out, but it was really just that she couldn't participate in things like that anymore. She couldn't help me do a lot of things when it comes to planning a wedding. And I was working a full-time job. I had, you know, friends and a social life and my relationship with my fiance and trying to plan this wedding. That's like a full-time job itself. And I felt overwhelmed and stressed out just with my life at the time. And trying to include my mom in those things just made everything a lot harder to get done. So it was, of course, easier for me to not include her, but then you feel guilty for not including her. And, you know, it's just a spiral and it just never ends. The entire time your loved one is sick, it just never ends. It's just, if you're not feeling guilty about this and you're feeling guilty about that, and then it's going to lead to a million other things that you're going to feel guilty for. And it, I just, you know, it just, just never goes away. 
And I believe that because we're like I said earlier, we're kind of in the same trajectory, having lost moms almost in the same week. Actually, it was the same week. I can do math, really. <laughs> as long as there's dollar yeah. signs, I can do math. <laughs> but I know there's times I feel guilty still. Like, well, maybe I shouldn't have put her in the memory care, or maybe I should have visited more than once or twice a week, or you know, and like taking her to the doctor was a freaking nightmare. And it, and I hated doing it because, you know, you can't schedule a doctor's appointment around your schedule and mom's. And, you know, it's just like, okay, apparently I don't matter in this scenario. I'm just the driver, but I'm the one with all the information because if you ask my mom something, chances are you're not going to get facts especially because she was very late stages and ugh, it was just, you know, you just, there's times I look back and I think, Oh my gosh, especially for me, I, I had guests telling me instead of going Mondays for two hours, you should go a couple times a week for an hour. And I'm like, but I work and Mondays work yeah. for me. And if I don't have it, if it's not like I'm going to see mom on X day, at X time, like I would go Mondays after our rotary meeting, I was already out of the house. You know, it just, it was just very easy. And I didn't work quote unquote work on Mondays. I mean, I did until my dad died and then I stopped making appointments. Most people know I was a photographer. I'd stop making like, I would do a bit like business headshots on Mondays cause they were easy and you know, it didn't, didn't require a lot of time. So it didn't matter that I wasn't home like most of the day because I our meetings were over at 1 30. So I would schedule people at like two or after. So it didn't, I didn't have to be like home getting everything ready in the studio. And after my dad died, it was like, I'm just gonna go and visit on Mondays after the meeting because I'm already out. The housekeepers come on Mondays, so I'm not gonna be in their way if they come late, whatever. It just works. And then right at the end, December of 2019, I finally said, you know what? I can't do these visits like this anymore. So I, what was it? The, it was like the Monday before Christmas, I went, I picked her up, I put her in the car, drove around the building to the assisted living dining room, which was beautiful. And they had great food. So it was a really nice way to have a nice lunch, but be kind of in a controlled environment which the following week was a really helpful thing. And we sat next to one of the Christmas trees, which was like 20 feet tall. And she's like, oh, it's Christmas. And I'm like, I don't understand how you can see this Christmas tree and this Christmas stuff everywhere and yeah. not realize it's Christmas. That was just really interesting and baffling to me. I mean, it wasn't surprising because I she'd already forgotten like seasons didn't mean anything to her. And you know, I know in California, we don't have like dramatically different seasons, but she would always point out the hills around between her house and my house nine months out of the year or eight. They're brown. When it rains in the winter, doesn't take too much rain, but they get green for a while. Brown again. You know, I figured as we moved her in, it was super green. We drove, there was one day we were driving to my house and I'm like, gosh, she's going to notice these hills are brown and she's going to know she's been there longer than we told her she'd be there. And it was just like, I was just like, literally like driving, like thinking, oh, and she like zero clue. So yeah. we're sitting in this assisted living dining room and we had the best lunch. It was literally like an hour. Picked her up, like say at noon, put her in the car. We had lunch and I gave her her gift. and then. Like literally, I don't, I didn't have a timer on, but I was like, we're going to cut this off at an hour. And then after an hour, put her back in her jacket, put her in the car, drove back around the building and took her back into the memory care part of the community. Best visit we'd had ever, pretty much, because it was short. We had like mm -hmm. literally get in the car, get out of the car, eat, gift back in the car out of the car, hugs, loves, and it was over. So it was, there was like little chunks of details that you want to say, I don't know. If, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a timeline, but it kind of felt that way, which worked out great. But the next week she'd fallen 
and she ended up with stitches mm. over her eye and unbeknownst to mm. me because i think half of the her doctors were idiots they did a they did a cat scan on her head to make sure there wasn't a brain bleed which made sense but she this particular day she was so nasty i mean literally i have a photograph of her holding the napkin up by her face with her face turned away from me she was so mad at me because mm. um i was trying to help her it was really terrible and yeah. what it turned out to be is that she had a cracked pelvis, which oh. they found when she broke her leg. So it's like, I'm not fond of doctors, but yeah, it's like, mm. I still feel guilty about that day, even though it's like the reason she was being so nasty wasn't my fault. I mean, I was like, try, I mean, literally somebody else had to put her in my car. She was so mad at me that this, this old yeah. lady, the gal that did the activities in the assisted living community had to put my mom in the car. And I was like, Oh, this is terrible. And I still uh, feel bad about yeah. that day. And even though I'm like, I know it's not my fault. So I just find the guilt to yeah. be insane. And I'm wondering if it's because, yeah. you know, you're you're grieving them. It's anticipatory or early grief because you know what's coming and you can't fix it and you can't make it better. Or it's just, a, you know, you're like constantly chasing this problem. And you know what's coming, you know, Laura and I have both been there. And I just, I just, I don't yeah. know. I think the guilt is crazy. How did you deal yeah, with I think the guilt? I mean, not well, <laughs> <laughs> not well. Uh, we need to fix that for all of us caregivers. <laughs> <laughs> That's why uh, I think it's so important for people like, you know, now that I have been through it and I'm on the other side, like, I feel like when you're going through it, you're in constant fight or flight mode and you're just trying to put out like one fire to get to the next fire so you can put that fire out. And you don't have time to like think about all of your thoughts and feelings and process like what is happening and what you're going through and your grief and how you feel about it. And now that I am through it, I have a lot of time to process and think about it. And I'm a very uh, analytical, like processing type of person. I think a lot and I really um, think it's important to share like all of these things that I've learned that I'm continuing to learn because even though my mom is gone now, there's still, like you said, you just go back and I think about all these times, like specific, it's crazy the things that you remember and like a specific day, a specific lunch, or like one conversation that is just like so fresh in your mind, and you can have such deep regret about it and play it over and over in your head. And I've just learned so much in doing that, that it's like, I wish I had like someone's story like that to read when I was going through it, because it might have helped me to deal with the grief or the guilt a little and the grief a little bit better. If I had had someone who had gone through it sharing just like these personal anecdotes and all these stories about what it was like and what they've since learned, it might have helped me to deal with it a little bit better because I really didn't deal with with the guilt well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I when I was uh, 28 years old, I quit my full-time job and I became a caregiver for my mom. I was a part-time caregiver. My dad uh, still worked full-time and I, he was pretty much working like a half day schedule. So I would go over to their house while he was at work and he would come home and I would go home and I would feel bad for like leaving as soon as he got home. But I had my own house. I had my own life. I had things to do, things that I wanted to do, but I felt bad for wanting to go do those things. I felt bad that I wanted to be somewhere else. I felt bad that I didn't stay for five more minutes or I felt bad that I didn't, I couldn't call my mom today. And so I could be at my dad's or my mom and dad's house for like five hours. You know, he would come home from work and I would have to leave and I would get home and I would immediately like feel like I didn't do enough. And I should have stayed longer. I shouldn't have left as soon as my dad got home. I should have stayed, you know, and, and I would text my dad or I would call my mom later. And 
it was just this constant feeling of never enoughness and just nothing was ever enough. Nothing I ever did, nothing I ever said. And it went on like that just for the entire time. And I pretty much just gave up my whole life because of my mom's Alzheimer's that if I wasn't there physically there with her helping her, or if I wasn't on the phone talking to her, I was thinking about her. I was doing things for her. I was worried about her. I, it just in my mind, I never left their house and <clears throat> I never went back to a, a regular job. Uh, I lost friends, you know, I lost, I had no life because that just consumed my life. Everything I did, everything I thought about, like that was it for me. And a lot of that was because I felt guilty having a life without them. I had, I felt guilty having a life that didn't have anything to do with them. Like if I was doing something, it had to be with them, for them, about them. And I just guilted myself into like just completely losing myself and not having a, a sense of a life whatsoever. And there were uh, times twice during my mom's illness that my husband and I moved away for his career. And even though I was living a plane ride away from my parents, I still felt like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't have a life. I couldn't enjoy myself. If I was if I happened to be out with a friend laughing and having fun, I would immediately think, oh God, you can't do that. You can't, Lauren, like, we well, can't have fun. How dare you? Because God only knows what's going on at your parents' house right now. Like, what do you think your mom and dad are doing right now? They're not having fun. And it was just these, this constant like guilt and just thinking that way and beating myself up about everything. And I, I didn't deal with it. Like the only way that, uh, or the only thing that really helped me was my writing because I would write about all of these things and it helped me to process it and to write it down. And it's very therapeutic for me to get that out, but it didn't stop the guilt. It didn't like end those feelings. And that's why I have such a passion for sharing my story still now and continuing on and things that I've learned because I would love to help some other young women or anyone going through this to not feel such guilt about it. Like it's not your fault that your parent or a loved one has Alzheimer's. It's not their fault. And right now there's no treatment. There's no cure. There's nothing you can do to fix it. You can't stop it. No matter how many lunches you make for them, no matter how many doctor's appointments you take them to, no matter how many walks you go for, no matter, you know, you can change the journey by being there for them and loving them and trying to make them happy. You're not always going to be able to do that. And that's okay because this isn't your fault and there's nothing that you can do to stop it or to make them better or to fix it. And I just hope that people can realize that and just know that no matter how many things you do, you're going to feel guilty for that one thing that you didn't do. And that's just a vicious pattern to get caught in. And it, it will never go away. It will never end. Very destructive. I always felt as a teenager, like my entire life, both my parents are gone and I still feel this way. So I'm asking if you had the same issue before she was sick. I never felt like anything I did was good enough. It's like, you know, I was not a straight A student, but I got good grades, but it wasn't good enough. And it just seemed like everything I did was like, oh, well, that's good. But maybe you should do X. Maybe they were just trying to be helpful. I don't know. But it's like I have that problem. It, and that's like the the button somebody can push super easily. I may do something and they maybe they just innocently suggest an addition to what I'm doing or think about it in this like totally innocent no no you know bad feelings whatsoever and it's just like it's like they might as well just jab me with an ice pick because I just I just get really uptight and so I thought that guilt of feeling like everything I did was not enough was an extension of how I felt growing up so did you have the same thing when you were growing up or I can't remember if I asked you this oh, a long time I ago. I didn't have that type of guilt. Like my parents 
just my sister and I were like the center of their world. And my mom told everybody about me and my sister and what great things we did. And she just would, I always say like, she, there's this cashier at the grocery store that knew like my life story. And I was like, mom, she doesn't care. But my mom would just tell her because she she was so proud of every little thing that we did. But I did have guilt for going out with my friends or not being home enough. Or uh, when I was in high school, I had a job after school. So I would come home from school. I would go to work. I would come home. I would do my homework. And I would feel bad for not spending enough time with my mom. If uh, on the weekend I went out with my friends, I would feel bad that I was going out with my friends and I wasn't home with my mom. And, you know, my mom kind of made me feel bad about that because she would say, don't you want to spend time with us? Don't you want to be home with us? Why do you always have to go out? Why do you always have to be with your friends? But for me, I was just a normal teenager. Like that's what teenagers do. But I did have that sense of guilt. And I think that kind of led into my caregiver guilt because it was a lot about like the time for me that I wasn't, I didn't stay long enough. I wasn't with her long enough. I didn't, I wasn't on the phone long enough. I should have stayed, you know? And, and so that kind of, um, I think played into my guilt. I think, uh, a lot of it, and I can't speak for a man because I'm not a man, but I think women just have guilt about everything. Like no matter what you have guilt, it's just, something that I feel like it's ingrained in a lot of women. You just have that guilt for not taking care of everyone else and doing everything for everyone. I mean, I feel guilty for my dogs. Like if I want to go out and go for a run in the morning before I take them for a walk, I feel bad about that. And I know I'm going to come home and take them for a walk after my run, but I feel bad that I didn't take them for a walk first. I mean, it's just like, and I always say to my husband, am I abandoning you if I go do this? Am I abandoning the dogs if I go do this? And it's just like this. And he's like, no, you're being ridiculous. You know, you don't, but he doesn't have that like guilt chip in him, you know, but pretty much every woman that I know has that. I wonder if that's like an you just over... feel guilty about everything. Yeah. It's like, it's gotta be related to the nurturing part of like female biology or psychology or both. I don't know. But um, there was a question I was going to ask you. I, what I'm hearing is for whatever reason, we feel guilty that we are still having a life and we Mm -hmm. expect to maintain our life while they're slowly losing theirs. And one of the other things, and this is actually a soapbox that I'm starting to get on more vocally, more out there, is it makes me insane that this country, you know, we're supposed to be like the smartest, the richest, the most technology, you know, forward thinking, blah, blah, blah. Somebody gets sick with Alzheimer's and the like literally the collective society goes, well, of course, the family is just going to give up their lives and take care of them. And it's like, um, I'm sorry, but I'm 25 or my I still have a kid at home or why that it's like me. I'm not taking care of somebody else. You know, I that's not how I felt. But that is a completely legitimate thing. Not everybody can be a caregiver. You know, I, I, yeah. I hear for people who feel or. They're pressured into being a full-time caregiver because there are no options. We have a situation yeah. going on where there are abusive family members that probably have some cognitive impairment. They don't have a lot of money. There are no options. And so I have been telling this particular family member, I realize you don't have a legal obligation to do anything for these family members the police, the social workers, the churchy do-gooder neighbor, they ain't going to care. Once these two people cause more problems for this small segment of like their circle, they're going to, they're going to harass the crap out of you until you do something. And I'm like, and he he just keeps saying, I'm not legally obligated to do anything. I'm just going to keep telling him that I'm like, "Mm, that's true. 
but I don't think that's going to serve you well because there are no other options. It makes me insane. Totally insane. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like there was a particular governor from a particular state that I happen to live in that decided that it was against people's civil civil liberties if you had a mental illness to be locked up. And then so they let them all out. Now we have this huge homeless problem and we have no facilities, no, there's no anything. My husband's a property manager. He's a real estate broker. And one of the tenants of the house he manages is next door to a gal who does not have family, is definitely got cognitive problems, is also a huge drinker, has driven her car and run over mailboxes, sits on the porch and screams and yells at, I don't know, strangers in the cloud. I mean, like, she's a problem. And there's nothing anybody yeah. can do with her. Like, what are we supposed to do with her? That makes me insane. So yeah. it's like, that is the soapbox <laughs> that I'm I'm trying not to climb on too often, but we really, really have to do better. And I, I, I just, just this week, and I can't remember which one of these episodes coming out first, but if this is a repeat, you guys will just have to hear it again. I had a conversation with, um, caregiver slash this person does um it's a streaming entertainment s- service for older adults with cognitive impairment sounds like a terrific program to me and we ended up on the discussion of we need to start focusing on how people can live better with dementia and alzheimer's they have a component in their program where there's like volunteer opportunities so people in the earlier stages of dementia can maybe support each other online, like kind of like what we're doing through Zoom right now, and, you know, write letters to prisoners, veterans, I forgot what the other part of the list was, but, you know, something along those lines. And it just got me to thinking, it's like if our society figured out a way of helping people like our moms live better, then maybe we wouldn't have them stuck at home because that's the safest place for them. And it's the easiest way to manage their challenges. I don't know. I think we'd all be better off. And I, I haven't done it yet, but I've also got an interview coming up with a guy. His life partner also has early onset Alzheimer's. He had a medical issue that for between his medical issue, which he's a pilot and he, so you can relate because Lauren's husband is also a pilot. He had a heart issue. So he got like desk jobbed, I think. It's not really detailed in his book. And he's like, I don't really want to do this job again. I've done that before. I want to, you know, so I don't want to do this job. My life partner has early onset Alzheimer's. So he retired early, which thankfully he was able to do. That's not always a good option for most people. And they have traveled the world and they do marathons all over the world. Which first off, that's like, ew, why would you want to do marathon? (laughs) You run. I'm a cyclist. I don't run. I don't run away from the bear. I don't run (laughs) to catch the ice cream truck. I don't run. (laughs) But I'm I'm gonna ask him because you know, we're taught that, you know, we have to keep their daily routine the same and not have a lot of disruptions and changes. Well, heck, going to all these different countries all the time and then flying home to switch out the clothing. And then flying someplace else, that's all that is, is just constant change. Yeah. I can't wait to talk to him about how, I'm wondering if that's actually better. Not that most of us could do that, but it's just a kind of an interesting thought on living better with dementia. Plus the, it's the stimulation has been helping her. Obviously the exercise helps her. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward to that conversation. So I know you've written a second book. It's not out yet. Is this like right. part two of the story? Because I forgot exactly yeah. where where the first one ended. Yeah. So uh, my first book, it's called Learning to Weather the Storm, A Story of Life, Love, and Alzheimer's. And that is available now on Amazon. That covers like really the first half of my mom's journey um, from the point that we started noticing symptoms and like what the different things were that we saw that we were concerned about. Uh, how she got her diagnosis, uh, me planning my wedding, um, 
when I made the decision to quit my full-time job, became a caregiver, kind of goes through that. Um, and I really talk about like how I came to a place of just acceptance of her disease and that I could still have a relationship with her, even though it would be a lot different than the relationship I had always pictured or the life I had always pictured that we would have together. I could still have a life with her and a relationship with her. And that kind of changed um, the way that I looked at caregiving and the way that I just looked at her disease, where it was really, I really went from like thinking about it as how it affected me to thinking about it, how it was affecting her and how could I make her life better and her journey with Alzheimer's better and happier and more joyful and things like that. So the second book that I am currently editing, uh, actually sending it to an editor friend um, next week for her to start editing. So hopefully, I don't want to say when it'll be out because I, you know, I don't want to be too optimistic, but I'm hoping in the next like couple of months, it'll definitely be done and um, out and self-publishing. So that's a great thing about it. I have total control over all of that stuff. Um, so that book is going to be called When Only Love Remains, Surviving My Mom's Battle with Early Onset Alzheimer's. And in that, in this book that I'm currently still working on, I talk all about the second half of our journey. Uh, after I had been living away for like a year and a half to support my husband's career, and I had just moved back home and I told my husband, I don't want to get a job. I just want to be my mom's caregiver. And I talk about how that went the first year um, and how I had a near nervous breakdown by the end of the year. Um, and that led to the transition into uh, hiring professional in-home caregivers uh, through a care agency. I talk all about that process, what that was like, finding a person. Um, and then uh, just sort of all of the thoughts and feelings and everything that went along with that, how it affected my relationship with my dad. And then my husband and I uh, moved away again to support his career. I talk a lot about um, the real depression that I endured while we were living away, um, just being far away from family, being far away from my mom and our decision to move back home. And then I talk all about uh, the end of my mom's life and when she passed away last April and a little bit about um, the year since that she, um, the year since she passed away and, and what that's been like and kind of processing my grief and everything. So I feel like there might be a third book because I feel like there's just so much that it's just like impossible to get it all. And I just like, I want to include as much as I can. I'm very real and honest and open about my journey. Uh, I pretty much don't leave anything out because I just feel like if I have felt a certain way or had a thought about it, a certain thought, somebody else has felt that and somebody else has had that thought. And I just really want so much to be able to relate to other people that are going through it so that they know they're not alone and so that it can maybe help them either while they're still on this journey, or even I get a lot of messages from people who they might say, my mom passed away 15 years ago, but your writing has helped me process it so much because I never really thought about it that way, or I never considered this and like, it's helped me heal. And so it's really important for me to include as much as I can and just to be as transparent about what it really was like for me, um, because I just feel like it, it's got to help somebody. And as long as it can help even one person, then I'll never regret, you know, writing it. And, and I also write about, um, I'm not sure if we talked about this before, but my mom passed like at the height of the COVID restrictions. So we could only have a 10 person graveside service for her funeral, which largely contributed to my grief of losing her funeral. You know, my mom has lost so much through this 10 year battle with Alzheimer's. We have lost so much as a family and I never ever pictured her funeral being that way. It was not something I ever thought would happen. It was not something I ever considered. And it 
killed me that my mom had to lose her funeral too, on top of everything that she had lost along the way, everything that we had lost as a family and to have to lose that too, for my mom to have to lose that, for us to have to lose the closure of having everyone gathered together and grieving together. And it really contributed to um, my grief and and this past year of trying to heal through that was just an, an added layer of grief to go through. So I write about that in the book as well. Well, I can totally relate. This is coming out, I believe in June. Today is April 8th. So it's four days past the year mark for your mom. My mom was cremated because that's what my dad did. Everything for my mom was dictated by his choices, which irritates the crap out of me. That's kind of how they lived. He is interned at a military cemetery. So it's 110% not my mom. And she's still with us. My husband's like, well, we probably should call the cemetery again, see if they've got caught up because we were literally... I mean, there must be a backlog and the annoying people are Mm -hmm. probably, I don't don't say that critically, but people who care more. And the reason I say care more is because I have mixed emotions about putting my mom there because it's like, it's my mom was not in the military. My dad was in the Marine Corps for four years, like two before they were married and two after. Something about that, that's a that's close. I know, I'd have to look at all the dates, but that's pretty close. And it's just not her. I know what she wants. And we we are going on a road trip. Hopefully that's what's planned. Mm-hmm. And I'm seriously thinking about taking her with us and sprinkling her ashes in all of the beautiful places that we're going to see. We're going up the West Coast into Canada, hopefully. Ontario is currently on like their third lockdown. So that's not really a positive scenario, although Ontario is further away from British Columbia. So Lord only knows at this date, if we if we bump up to the Canadian border and can't cross over, we'll just loop back around. There's plenty of beautiful places on the West Coast to look at. So it's not a problem as long as I can get out of my town. I'm so tired of this town, <laughs> but I'm seriously, I, I had come up with a, Celebration of life, plan not plan because there was no plans to make, but my mom was a huge sugar fiend. And so because my dad's funeral was huge, 300 people, lunch catered, it was over, it was overwhelming. And so I told my sister, you know, dad's funeral was overwhelming. I have this great idea for mom. I said, we'll just keep it simple, do you know, a celebration of life. And I said, I think we should just do a dessert bar. And my sister looked at me and she goes, I don't want to do two events. (laughs) I'm like, well, F you. (laughs) So my mom is still in my house. And Mm. so I'm thinking about just taking her, sprinkling her ashes everywhere, putting sand in the box and giving the box to my sister and going, here you go. You can put her with dad now. That's where I'm at. But I mean, it really is just. It really is just such uh, a huge part of our healing to have some type of closure. Um, and I remember when my mom passed, we we had, um, of course, when you know she's on hospice and you know that it's coming. And so we started making plans, um, which everyone should do. But we had started making plans. My dad went and got a uh, plot at the cemetery that that they wanted to be at. Um, He went to a funeral home and met with them and had like these plans that just went out the window. And the day after my mom died, my dad and I went to the funeral home together to meet with the funeral director. And it was just like, you can only have 10 people at a graveside service. We were allowed to have a viewing also limited to 10 people. It was limited to like 45 minutes. Um, just one one time right before the graveside service. So not the typical, like you have one at night and then you have it maybe again in the morning. And then, and uh, my parents are Catholic. So they would have wanted to have a full mass, uh, full Catholic mass at our church. And 
go to the cemetery to have the burial. And then we would have had uh, some like luncheon gathering type that, I mean, we didn't get to do any of that stuff. And so knowing at, knowing at that time that this is what it's going to be is okay, well, we'll make the most of it. At least, you know, it's us, the people that matter to her the most. And at least we can, you know, just trying to find like what we had to be grateful for in that moment that we could still do this and we can still have that. And we still had a bagpiper play amazing grace at the graveside service, which was one thing that my mom, like the only thing that she ever told us she wanted to have at her funeral was to have Amazing Grace played on the bagpipes. So I was so happy that we could still do that for her and little things like that. But, you know, we kind of left that day saying, okay, we're going to have, and even in her obituary, I wrote, we will have a larger service celebration of life at some point in the future. We still haven't had that. (laughs) And I mean, there's no, no one thought that this was going to go on for this long no part of me thought that it would be a year after her death and we still haven't had a memorial service. We thought maybe um, we had initially thought my parents' anniversary is in August. And that just so happened to be when her headstone was finally ready. And we thought maybe we can do something then, but we couldn't. Her birthday was in January. We thought maybe we can do something for her birthday, but we couldn't. Her one year was on April 4th still couldn't do anything. So it's hard. And, you know, it's the immediate family, like we're lucky that we have been able to do things. So with my, my dad and my sister and her family, um, but there's so many more people that want to celebrate her life or remember her and just haven't been able to do that. And it's just, it really adds a lot of, um, grief and and another layer of loss and just feeling like this sucks. <laughs> like it just sucks that you can't do that. Yeah. I felt like, you know, cause we California, I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. So the seven counties that make up the Bay area went on lockdown first. And so my mom broke her leg on the eighth. I saw her on the, the <clears throat> 10th, 12th, 14th and 16th. And on the 16th, they said, we're not letting any more visitors in after today. And I was like, okay. And not super thrilled about that, but I had hospice. I, the care staff was great. So I'm like, you know, I don't know that I want to be here because I don't want to like risk getting sick. I already felt like I'd taken a risk with her and I in the hospital. And so I was like, okay. And so after a week, it was like, um, okay, my mom thinks I'm her best friend. She trusts me. She knows I'm the fun person, takes her out to the park to go watch kids. If we go on much longer, she's going to forget that. She's already combative and we're going to have issues. So at about a week, so this would have been like the third week of March, I was like, okay, well, there's no place for me to go. I've worked from home for at this point now over 16 years. Everything was canceled. So my rotary meetings, like I had no, if I'd wanted to leave the house, there was no place to go other than the grocery store, which that was no fun. So I just stayed home. I like walked the dogs and that was it. And that about day 10 of the lock first lockdown or whatever we want to call it. I was like, okay, I have like been home for 10 days. I'm going to give us a couple more days and then I'm, then I'm storming the gates going in. I had a good relationship with the executive director. I was going to call him. I'm like, I'd be like, I'll climb through her window, like whatever, but I'm coming in, you know, this is just, (laughs) this is what's going to happen. But, you know, I was like trying to be reasonable, you know, nobody really understood what was going on. I knew she was being cared for. I didn't like not being able to see her. So I was like trying to balance like everybody's needs and, you know, and so it got to the, so we got to two weeks and they called me and said, well, she's not doing so great. We, we think she'd do good with a visit from you, which I now have learned was a code for, holy crap, she's going to die. We better let him in. So we were very lucky. My sister and my niece and uh, saw her, I saw her Monday morning. My sister and my niece saw her Monday night and I did a podcast recording on the 31st in the late morning and they called and they said, come now. And so we went off Mm -hmm. and we didn't get there in time. 
but I did get to see her. I mean, she wasn't awake, but that's okay. You know, and then it was like, please leave. There's 10 of you in the memory care and we didn't oh. want anybody in here. And there's, t- there was my sister and I, my husband, my daughter, her fiance, my sister's, you know, there's four people, in my sister's family, there's four people in my family, one of my mom's brothers and her sister. So there's like literally 10 of us and the poor executive director was like <laughs> trying really hard not to like have a breakdown. <laughs> I, felt, yeah. I felt bad. And then I looked at him and I said, I'll come back this weekend and take, clean out her stuff. No, no, no. We're not letting anybody in. So then it was like, okay, so you go home and you're like, now what? Now what? Yeah. So it's like life just went on, you mm-hmm. know, and then my sister's like, I don't want to do two services. And I'm like, fine. I was just going to do the dessert bar celebration of life. My daughter and I on her own, no problem. You know, my sister has been like that her whole life. So that wasn't shocking. Well, it was, but not mm-hmm. terribly. And then that still hasn't happened. And so I thought, I was like you. Okay, well, we'll do something around the one year anniversary. That didn't happen. Yeah. And then I thought, well, let's maybe do something around Mother's Day. I don't think that's going to happen. So I had somebody, I think it was a podcast guest, basically say, some Mother's Day, when this is behind <laughs> us, just have a celebration for all moms. Like my grandmother, my 103-year-old grandmother is currently on hospice. By the time this comes out, I'm pretty sure she'll be gone. Uh, My aunt, who has been taking care of her forever, (laughs) is going to urge her to go be with her husband and her oldest son. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I was very, my aunt is very religious, unlike some of us. So when she like announces that she's going to go tell my grandmother it's time to go, I was like, oh, man, I, I don't have those kind of, you know, I think that, but I would never say that to her. So I was really surprised she said that. It was very funny. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, I'm just going to do a celebration for my friend's moms who are gone and my, you know, everybody's, I'm going to just do a big fancy Mother's Day tea and it'll probably be 2022, hopefully, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, it felt like, well, okay, mom's gone. Just move on with life. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's been, That's it's so, a, I. Yeah, my heart goes out to everyone who uh, throughout the past year in, you know, 2020 and now into 2021 in having a loved one in a nursing home and not being allowed to go visit them for months and months or even a year. I mean, depending on where you live, it's different for everybody. But I just I can only imagine how heartbreaking and how difficult that is. And, you know, I know for my family, my dad said from the beginning, he would never place my mom in a nursing home or a memory care facility of any type. Uh, That was just something that he, it was non-negotiable for him. He was just never going to place her in a facility. And there was a time in her illness that my sister and I were fighting him on that because we felt like uh, she needs more care than we can give her. She's not, she's not getting the proper care at home. This is too much for us to manage. Um, She should be in a memory care facility. But he was so adamant against it that we kind of stopped pushing for that and just started pushing for home care. And I talk all about that in my new book. Um, If you're going to keep her at home, fine, but you need help. We need help. It can't, you can't just rely on the family members to do everything and to help out because at the time it was just my dad and myself, my sister had a full-time job and she was starting a family. um, So she couldn't be a caregiver and I was really struggling with it. And so that was when we really pushed um, toward the home care, which thankfully got that all situated and worked out well. Um, And then come 2020, when the pandemic hit and all the facilities were being shut down on lockdown and all these things. And my mom is lying in a hospital bed in her living room dying. And I just thought to myself, if she was in a facility right now, I would not be able to come see her. And because she was at home, I could go see her. I went to see her almost every day. Um, I don't think I went more than like a couple of days without going to visit her at my parents' house. And um you know, I was so grateful to be able to still do that. And I just thought to myself, oh, that's why 
she never, you know, when you are going through something and you're frustrated and you're like, why won't my dad put her in a facility where she can get the care she needs and this and that, and you're frustrated with them. But in the end, I realized like, oh, like this was so important that she was home because we were able to see her up until the end. And only for the fact that she was still at home. If she had been in a facility, we would have been, you know, not allowed to visit. They would have been on lockdown. No one would have been allowed to visit. Um, From what I understand from most people who did have a loved one in a facility, they would get the call. Oh, your, you know, your loved one is in active dying and you're allowed to come in for a visit. And so they would be let in like, if, and only when uh, their loved one was actively dying. My mom was not really in the active dying phase. I mean, I saw her the one day of checking for the signs of active dying, things that I knew to look for. She didn't have anything. I mean, as much as we knew that it was coming and as much as we expected it, we did not expect it when it happened. It was overnight. She was sleeping and she just didn't wake up. And that's about the most peaceful uh, passing that you could ask for, for someone who has Alzheimer's. And I'm so grateful that that was her experience. I know so many people, it's not that way. Um, But I just think to myself, oh, if she was in a facility, I wouldn't have been allowed to see her for however many weeks. And I would have just gotten a call one morning that she had passed overnight. And it would have been like, what, you know, and I wouldn't have been there to see her for weeks at by that time. So I'm so grateful that that was our experience. And just my heart just really goes out to everyone that is still dealing with that um, and not being able to see their loved ones or just not the frequency of visits that you would like or just not being able to touch them. Like, I mean, touch is so important. And when you can't have uh, verbal communication and things like that, I mean, it touches everything. And to not be able to touch them, hold their hand, give them a hug. I mean, that's just heartbreaking. Just really heartbreaking. Yeah, I have actually been on that particular soapbox. By last summer, when we realized this is not going away quickly, all of the long-term care communities nursing homes, et cetera, needed to figure out a way of keeping their residents safe and not killing them from isolation. I'm like a really big, I have not too loudly because I don't want to like offend or upset other people, but every time I see the stories of, you know, getting to see grandma for the first time in over a year, I'm heart warmed. And then I'm angry because I'm like, Mm -hmm. You know, you lost your mom during the pandemic. I lost my mom during the pandemic. And it's like, you know, a lot of people lost a loved one that they didn't get to see at all. You know, we were, I was lucky, you know, your mom was at home. So you were lucky. Not, I mean, it's not lucky, but you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, and I've said this a gazillion times, people are probably going to start getting tired of hearing it, but it's like my maternal grandfather said, none of us gets out of this life alive. And so I think this goes back to living well with dementia. And I have talked to a lot of people who do everything to keep their loved one like going and healthy and everything, which is good. But it's really easy to cross the line into prolonging their dying. It's like they have a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with what the end looks like, you need to get familiar with what the end looks like because. I've seen recently people saying, well, you know, this family member's got, you know, they're like in early to mid stage Alzheimer's and they've got like a breast tumor, which your mom had breast cancer and was treated and and was cured of that. You know, and they're asking, is it true that the anesthesia can make the dementia worse? Yes, it's true. It can. Doctors are going to tell you, meh, there's, there's no like super concrete evidence it's all anecdotal so whatever a doctor tells you is just going to be based on their experiences and other people have different experiences so i don't when i say doctors don't know it's not that they don't want to know it's just i don't think there's enough evidence but it's like i think it would be so much better my mom actually had an ovarian tumor for the last almost year well probably the last year of her life 
And I didn't do anything about it because it's like, why? She wouldn't understand. Yeah. Wouldn't understand the surgery or the treatment or what she needed. To do. I'm like, oh my gosh, all of the nightmares. And this is a this is breaking news because I have not said this on the podcast. And there was there was only like a handful of like my husband knew, my daughter knew, the support group facilitator knew, but I didn't tell family. I was the healthcare power of attorney. I knew that was the right decision to not treat it. And I did ask, I asked the, the facilitator of our support group, what's the worst case scenario other than dying if I don't treat it? And she told me like, sometimes the ovary could get twisted and that's a really painful thing. And I'm like, okay, that sounds ugly. I don't really want her to deal with that. But, you know, when she broke her leg, we didn't do the surgery because the the surgeon wasn't super thrilled with that, that idea. So I knew it wasn't really a good idea, but she needed physical therapy surgery or not. And when she basically swatted the physical therapist away, like he was going to molest her in her bed, I was like, okay, well we made the right decision there. So I knew it was the right decision, but you know, I'm just kind of grateful that the breaking of her leg was the final straw for her body because the end can be so bad. And we were yeah. getting close. Yeah. You know, I know people whose family members, you know, it's just, they, there's just no helping. There's no quality of life. There's no, it's just terrible. So when you're, you know, doing everything you can for them, at some point you have to accept that you have to let them go because you know, the end can be real. You know, like my mom like killed me. She know what the end was like. Yeah. Her. So, and the guilt yeah. continues, you know. <laughs> in, well, um, in my new book, I talk about um, an episode that my mom had, still don't really know what it was, um, about a, a little over a year before she passed away. Um, she had this little episode and someone had suggested um, that we should take, she should go to the hospital. Like maybe she had a stroke. You should take her to the hospital, but we made the decision not to, because taking her to the hospital would have been far more traumatic and damaging. Um, it's, it sounds harsh to say, but at a certain point, it's like, she's going to die anyway. And you kind of do want to just give them the most, not that I want that, not that I'm like, Oh, uh, oh, who cares? Just let her die. No, not like that at all. But it's an acceptance of a friend said to me, it is what it is. And you're not blowing it off, but it is what it is. And your mom has a uh, terminal disease. She's going to die from Alzheimer's if she you know, lives that long. And it's just an acceptance of it is what it is. And I'm, I'm not going to do anything to make this any harder on her than it already is. She, I want her to be as comfortable and as happy as she can be for as long as possible. I'm not going to do anything to prolong her life. That's why um, hospice is comfort care. That's what it is. There's no medical care. There's nothing to do to make them better or prolong their life. It's making them comfortable so that they can have a as comfortable of a passing as possible and hopefully some dignity in their passing, um, which I know is just, it's not the case for a lot of people who die from Alzheimer's. And, you know, my, my mom died from Alzheimer's. I don't know what that, that night that, that she took her last breath, everyone, no one was, you know, my dad was sleeping in the bed next to hers, but he didn't wake up or anything. Um, and so that's about as peaceful of a passing as, as I could ever have imagined or hoped for her to have um, because she never got to the point where she was on morphine and crying out in pain. And I mean, we never got to that point. And I know so many people that had a different experience that I I'm grateful that that was not our experience, but yeah, it's just, it's knowing, you know, you know, you know, when, you know what the right thing to do is and you know when and you know when to seek medical care uh, or when to just kind of accept it for what it is and just keep them as comfortable and as happy as you can for as long as you can and just to be there with them and for them. And I mean, that's all you can do. Yep. There's lots of decisions that just add to the guilt 
Yes. But I'm very excited to read, <clears throat> excuse me, your second book and probably the third. And we yeah. could be talking about this the whole rest of the day, but I have <laughs> another meeting and then another recording. And then a, my support group meeting is tonight. So this is a four Zoom day meeting for me. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be like non-screen tomorrow because <laughs> it, it does take your to- take a toll. I'm looking forward to not going to Rotary on Zoom and not going to my support group on Zoom. Yeah. This has been so great. And I'm so happy that we had this conversation. Some of it was, you know, pretty enlightening about our experiences. And like you said, if it helps one person, then we've done our job today. So Yeah. And you said this episode will probably be out in June. So yes. my book might be out by then. I'm hoping end of May, beginning of June. So if if it's out by the time this podcast comes out, then it'll be available on Amazon. Um, but anybody can go to my uh, Facebook and Instagram and my blog, Life, Love, and Alzheimer's across all platforms um, and sign up for my email list so you can get updates about when the book is coming out um, and all that good stuff. So looking forward to that. <laughs> and if if the second book is done by the time this comes out, you will notice because it will also be hot linked along with the first book and all of her social media pages. Perfect. So, thank you so much. This has been great. Yes. Thank I, you for like, having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.